How many feel like you have a calling of God on your life? So I want you to picture it today as if it's a phone call <laughs> and that he's calling you up and that you're going to answer the call. And it doesn't mean it's going to be easy to answer the call because if you know it's from God, you still want to be biblical, right? He said count the cost before you enter into something. Don't just be foolish about it, but, but know how to hear the voice of the Lord. Know how to distinguish that from the voice of the devil. And then there's a third voice. Anybody want to chime in on that one? Yeah, uh, the, our flesh, that old nature that doesn't want to fast when we call a church fast. I mean, that's partly the devil, but it's also our, our nature. We just we get, become like couch potatoes sometimes spiritually. You know, we'll do it tomorrow. We'll do it tomorrow. But there's nothing easy about serving God, but there's a lot meaningful about serving the Lord. And you have to decide what you want to be. If you have children that are in school and they want to win uh, a starting position on the football team, are you going to tell them it's easy? Well, should you tell them not to do it? Then No, it's something worth striving for, striving in a good way, right? It's what you aspire to. If I'm going to play on the team, Paul said if you're going to run the race, run it to win. So, yes, it can get unhealthy. We teach on performance orientation. We know there's a downside to it. But if you're going to do something, do it with a spirit of excellence. We work on our jobs for the Lord. Our company is secondary. We're first there as an employee of his, right? So I just want to look at some of these verses like, boy, talk about answering a difficult call, a dangerous yes. Might as well start right with Jesus, the founder uh, and the one that we worship, the, the God-man, the, the visible image of an invisible God. That's what it says in Colossians. It says he's talking to his disciples that are in the garden. He says, pray for yourselves that you won't sink into temptation. Jesus knows he's near the end now. And he had said to Peter in another place, the enemy's going to come for you. He wants to sift you out, but I have prayed for you. And when you return, right? So he's saying to them, I'm about to just separate a little bit and go pray over there. But pray for yourselves that you don't sink into temptation. And he distanced himself from them about a stone's throw and knelt there praying. Jesus said, Father, if you're willing, take this cup away from me. Yet, not my will, your will be done. You want a dangerous yes to when God asks you to do something? There it is right there. We sang it, like I said, it's a very convicting song, that last one that we sang, because we're saying, I want to burn for you, and I want you to purify my heart. Well, that means there's a detox, and if you ever tried to detox anything, you know it doesn't like to leave, does it? Anybody ever try quitting drinking coffee? The headaches that you get, like as that stuff is purging out, and you know, just have one more, it's no big deal, never mind tobacco or any of the other things, like they're so addictive. Try sugar. Try quitting sugar sometime and watch how hard that is. And I won't go there. We're going to talk about different demons today than that one. But <laughs> God finds us in a place, and it's usually not the optimum place, right, because there's always further we can grow in being more like Christ. Would you agree that we could start with that premise that no matter how far you've gone in Christ, you could still be more like him in some way? Because Paul said it. That's a good example. He said, I have not yet arrived. I know that he called me and I answered the call, but I'm still pressing towards the mark for the prize of that high calling that he has on me. And that's how I want to live my life every day. There's something else I could do to be more like him. Now, he's perfection, right? But, but, but what else are you going to aim at? Don't aim low. Aim high. Aim for Christ. And this is just such a beautiful picture that I, I've always remembered when I heard it preached by a man named Mark Hanby. Some of you that have been with us a long time remember him. And he just painted pictures with words that were very that imprinted on me. And he used this verse from Deuteronomy 32, verse 10, talking about God found Israel in a desert land and in the howling waste of the wilderness. And I've used this verse many times because that's what it was like doing drugs, was being like in the waste howling wilderness. This is the ESV, the King James says, the waste howling wilderness. Boy, did that paint the picture of what it's like to work for the devil. Every paycheck from the devil bounces. He's the worst boss. He's the best liar and the worst boss. So God finds us someplace in some kind of waste howling wilderness, which is just sin, 
Right? Whatever that sin is, it, imp it impacts each of us differently. But he found them there, and he encircled them, and he cared for them, and he kept him as the apple of his eye. Do you know that you're the apple of God's eye? That we don't just throw this verse out because it's in the Old Testament, but that you are his favorite. And isn't it cool that every one of us can say, I am God's favorite, and not be in any contradiction at all? Love it. His ways are way above our ways. But this is a good part right here. Like an eagle that stirs up its nest. And he, he would go into a very detailed story about this that I won't do today. But I don't know how well you could see that picture. But you could see the mama bald eagle up on here on the top right. And, and that's the kid that just got kicked out of the nest over there. And the kid is giving mom a dirty look right now. Like, I thought you loved me. <laughs> but, but what the scripture is saying as the eagle stirs up its nest, it starts flapping its wings. And the way he described it, all the feathers and the down that was in there, like the mattress, is gone. And all that's left is these big pointy sticks that are sticking up. So God will make it too uncomfortable for us to stay too long in the nest. And then he picks up the phone and calls and said, are you ready for your assignment? It's going to be a dangerous yes, but it's going to be a more dangerous no. <laughs> Whew. Let that one sink in for a minute because I don't want to be disobedient either. Oh, this is good. The mom flutters over its young, spreading out its wings and catching them and bearing them on its pinions. The Lord alone guided him. So that's a picture where mom doesn't just bail on the child, but when the, when the child's trying to learn how to fly, the eaglet is coming out and it's flapping its wings. When they're too young, the mother will come up underneath it and catch it and bring it back up again and then turn over again. <laughs> and the thing's just flapping its wings on the way down and mom comes up and catches it again. Can you relate? When God asks you to do something and you're not too comfortable about it? I remember early when I was singing with the guitar and trying to sing and play at the same time, literally, my knees were knocking. But I was behind a, a, a covering where nobody could see it. My mouth got real dry. I couldn't talk. I couldn't speak. All this cotton started coming up in my mouth. Because that's what happens when your body, when you're nervous. But how are you going to grow if you don't push through those places? And he wants us all to grow. So Every time God makes that phone call, there's a little bit of this picture of the mother flapping the wings and saying, look, I'm not going to have you living with me when you're 44 years old in the basement. You've got to stand on your own two feet. You have to individuate and become who God made you to be. And, you know, that's another day's topic because, Mom, you've got to let them go too. 